like this. Behold how good it is. Behold how pleasant where all God's people live as one. Behold how good. Good. It's on your first page. It is time for us now to start our prayer and Bible study. El amor y la fe vienen de la mano. Cuán bueno y cuán agradable How very bueno good and pleasant. es ver la creación cuando la cuidamos en conjunto. How very good and pleasant. Es sentir que podemos trabajar juntos y juntas para un mundo justo. How very good and pleasant. Cuando los niños y niñas se pueden reunir y jugar, y abrazarse como hermanos y hermanas, sin importar su raza, credo, color o nacionalidad. How very good and pleasant. Cuando aprendemos a hacer un espacio para vivir juntos unos con otros, con nuestras diferencias y distintas habilidades. How very good and pleasant. Cuando las alegrías de nuestros vecinos son nuestras alegrías, las penas de nuestro vecino son nuestras penas, y el bienestar de nuestro vecino es nuestro bienestar. How very good and pleasant. Cuando las armas se conviertan en arados. How very good and pleasant. Cuando aprendemos a unir nuestras manos y permitimos que los colores de la gracia de Dios toquen nuestras vidas y las cambian en armonía. How very good.
La lectura de la palabra de Dios dice así, Juan 13, 1 al 17. Antes de la fiesta de la Pascua, Jesús sabía que su hora había llegado para pasar de este mundo y volver al Padre. A los suyos que estaban en el mundo los había amado siempre y los amó hasta el fin. El diablo ya había puesto en el corazón de Judas Iscariote, hijo de Simón, que entregara a Jesús. Así que mientras cenaban, Jesús, que sabía que el Padre había puesto en sus manos todas las cosas y que había salido de Dios y que a Dios volvía, se levantó de la cena, se quitó su manto y tomando una toalla, se la sujetó a la cintura. Luego puso agua en un recipiente y comenzó a lavar los pies de los discípulos para luego secárselos con la toalla que llevaba en la cintura. Cuando llegó a Simón Pedro, éste le dijo, Señor, ¿tú me lavas los pies? Respondió Jesús y le dijo, lo que yo hago no lo entiendes ahora, pero lo entenderás después. Pedro le dijo, jamás me lavarás los pies. Y Jesús le respondió, si no te lavo, no tendrás parte conmigo. Simón Pedro le dijo entonces, Señor, lávame no solamente los pies, sino también las manos y la cabeza. Jesús le dijo, el que está lavado no necesita más que lavarse los pies, pues está todo limpio. Y ustedes están limpios, aunque no todos. Y es que él sabía que lo entregaría, por eso dijo, no todos están limpios. Después de lavarles los pies, Jesús tomó su manto, volvió a la mesa y les dijo, ¿saben lo que he hecho con ustedes?, Ustedes me llaman Maestro y Señor, y dicen bien porque lo soy. Pues si yo, el Señor y el Maestro, les he lavado los pies, también ustedes deben lavarse los pies unos a otros, porque les he puesto el ejemplo para que lo mismo que yo he hecho con ustedes, también ustedes lo hagan. De cierto, de cierto les digo, el siervo no es mayor que su Señor, ni el enviado es mayor que el que lo envió. Si saben estas cosas y las hacen, serán bienaventurados. Palabra de Dios. Good morning, dear friends. I hope you had a pleasant night. I wish to share with you some thoughts from our Bible study and the passage that we read in Spanish. Um, and in order to discipline myself, I've put some slides out so that I will keep to the point, not become a preacher, and indeed work with looking at the Bible and sourcing it so that it will open up ways in which we can think about our own mission together as Christians and also to look at our theme which looks at landscapes of church unity. And so I will primarily follow this particular pattern. I have three main sections And you will see that the main intent of what I wish to do with us is really to open us up to different dimensions of what we can do together and think through that creatively. So in a sense, this is not a sermon, it's a Bible study. It's studying the Bible to look for openings for us. If you look at the passage that we just read from John 13, you will notice 
that these are really twin parables. And you'll see that these twin parables that are placed very consciously by the gospel writer between two different bookends, as it were. If you look at this passage and see what comes before it, we notice that there is much conversation. There is much discourse that happens around it, before it and after it. So before this, we have immediately Jesus' teaching about his own mission. So you'll see primarily from John 12, 44 to 50, Jesus, in fact, dramatically cries out his summary of his own mission among them. And so there's words that goes before that. There are also words that go after that. And most of us know that from John 14 to 17 is his farewell discourse, both his farewell discourse and also his farewell prayer. So what we see here is this particular twin parables in action where Jesus acts symbolically, we see this is placed within lots of wordy discourse that comes around it. So we can say that we look at action in the midst of much dialogue and conversation. On the other hand, we also see in this particular reading that it starts off in John 13 by talking about time. And you see in this particular instance, in verse 1, you have both the gospel writer talking about this as the Passover, so the chronos comes in, the time that in fact is taking place chronologically comes in, but very quickly, this chronos also in verse 1 leads into a conversation about the kairos. So it's not just the Passover, and of course in John, this is basically the third Passover, where we know that from John 2.13 and from John 6.4, we know about the other two instances of Passover that's been marked. And so immediately here we see that the Kronos is the Passover the third time around, and yet it quickly leads to a deliberate shift in terms of looking at this as the Kairos. The time, if you'll remember, that had not yet come when Mary wants Jesus to turn water into wine that we saw in chapter 2, and the time that, in fact, and the hour that is come, which basically is the crucifixion and the cross, in that now we hear in 13, just before he starts washing the disciples' feet, you see primarily that this is the anticipated time again. The hour that had not yet come, that has not yet come to Mary, the hour that is upon them, suddenly Jesus actually brings back the central sign that is lifted up high on the cross. That being the hour, in fact, is upon them now. So you see that this primarily is a second set of lenses that the gospel reader has to keep in mind as we look at this particular text. This is one of the reasons why I chose this text. When I thought of landscapes of unity, I thought this particular text talks a lot about movement in space. So if we think of landscapes in the traditional way, we think of it primarily in terms of looking outside and see how different things take place in a particular spatial form. And here I thought to myself, what can we see in this passage that thinks of and allows us to dream about the possibilities of landscape, or in a sense, 
we can say the spatial way in which bodies are patterned in this particular text, even as Jesus washes the disciples' feet. So if landscapes means all the visible features of an area of countryside or land, then I am exploring features of social arrangement among members in their calling to be the body of Christ. This indeed is a landscape that we're trying to mine for thinking about Christian unity. Through this discussion, I wish to place before you two major themes that opens up our thinking on this particular passage, keeping in mind our own particular theme. So the first one, which I will go into shortly, subverts our traditional notion of how we think about the foundation of social spaces, and therefore how we can think about Christian unity. And the second that I will get to in about seven to eight minutes is reimagining church unity along the lines of spatial alignment rather than creedal declarations. So let me get to my first point of this notion that the feet rather than the head can be a foundation of church unity. The feet rather than the head can be a foundation of church unity. But before we get there, let me share with you the context that I come from and the context that in fact often determines our way of thinking about the head as a foundation. On the one hand, in my Indian culture, most of us are groomed to thinking about a form of the head being in control of the whole body. And if you can look at this particular uh, slide, you'll see the particular pictorial representation that I'm presenting to your left. You'll see that the Brahmins, and I would say it's really the priests, and includes myself a theologian, I am an ordained minister of the Church of South India, but also a theologian. It assumes that, in fact, we know most of it, and we can make decisions that bring unity to the whole body of Christ. And so this is how most of us are taught to think. So we have the Brahmins, the Kshatriyas, the second category of warriors and kings, we then have the business community at the Thais. The feet are the serving class. And well before that in the Indian context, you have the Dalits who are thought of the untouchables. So there you can say in this scheme of thinking where the head controls everything are the souls of the feet. Where everything rests and where dirt basically is held together. And so what happens a lot in this form of what we can call heady thinking, you have the priests and those who govern and administrate and theologians right on top trying to get the whole system to work within this particular form of unity. But let's not forget that as a Christian and also an Indian, I'm also inheriting another embedded form of theology in which for some reason also we are taught from very early in Sunday school this particular mental model that I have to your right where in some way yes we celebrate the people but we always talk to them that popular theology and official theology represents the head as the symbol of unity of the body of Christ. So the church as the invisible head of the body, 
the church, as Colossians 1.18, is held together with the visible body of Peter, priests, including theologians sometimes, administrators, on the head, that alone through the neck, which holds together the bureaucrats of administration, can bring unity to the body of God. And so you see, this is the kind of orientation that we primarily are groomed with from very early. We'll notice that, in a sense, Peter, in our passage, starts off with a conventional form of thinking. Right? So he comes, and when Jesus says, I'm going to wash your feet, Peter says, not my feet, maybe my hands, maybe my head, but not my feet, O oh Lord. But Jesus insists and pushes and tells him, Peter, unless I wash you, talking about his feet, you have no share of me. And then goes on to telling him that when I wash your feet, your whole body basically is cleansed. And so Peter starts off in our passage by being resistant because he also thinks that in a sense, it should all come from the head. You anoint the head and everything will flow down. But Jesus actually pushes and insists. My own sense is that Jesus also has learned from the anointing of his own feet by Mary. Another instance in which somewhat of a patriarchal society with a head that is male suddenly realizes that he can learn and uses this sign, the sign of Kairos, in which basically he says, now I know how to get the attention of my male peers that I have called to be disciples. And so we see in this wonderful crucifix that of course is imaginatively uh, represented by a 15th century painter called Masaccio. You see basically Peter symbolizing now for us the subversion of thinking that indeed unity can come from the feet. And this primarily is a way of cleansing so that the whole body will actually be freed and empowered. Now, it's very interesting, and I wish you to use both scriptural imagination and also the imagination that you have of knowing anything about your feet and people that, in fact, you have met, mostly who go barefoot and walk on the earth. What are the implications for thinking about unity when indeed we're thinking about the feet as a foundation of thinking of Christian coming together, empowerment, encouraging, and embodiment of the body of Christ. I've placed before us some themes that in fact come from looking at this particular way of changing and subverting thinking about landscapes of bodies that are gathered around the feet. So the argument that I have is that recognizing the feet rather than the head as foundational means a few things when we think through what indeed is church unity. So the first we realize is that feet-based church unity envisions just wholeness rather than harmonious order for the entire body. Now, most of us know this. If you think about feet and in recognition of your own body and people that you know around us and looking at the social body, you will realize that the feet basically takes on the weight of the whole body. It's on which everything stands. And so the feet, whenever it actually is transmitting knowledge, is also transmitting knowledge of bearing weight, being 
kind of push down weight that actually is too heavy because of a swollen head and too burly muscles, too much to eat, and therefore a lot of weight around everything. And so in a sense, the feet basically are weighed down by all that happens. This is basically the landscape of body, right? All of us know. So feet knowledge, in a sense, is a knowledge that talks back. It says, no, this is too much. I need to sit down for a while. No, I need to exercise. So unity that basically comes from the feet is a knowledge that, in fact, is trying to communicate burden, being weighed down. But also, as you know, in our society, feet basically are somewhat polluted. If the heart and head are pure, the feet are almost the soiled in society. They're not just weighed down because of overbearing, but they're also the particular member in our church and in our body that are despised. And that's why Peter objects. He says, Lord, not my feet, because he knows that there ought to have been servants to bring Peter in to wash his feet. And suddenly Jesus is going to that which is despised and wanting to wash his feet. And that's why Peter says, not my feet, O Lord, my hands. And of course, Peter generally thinks a lot about his idea of verbal proclamations. He says, maybe my head as well. But Jesus says, no, let's start. We actually work from the feet. And I want to draw upon the sacramental sign of the washing of feet and link it up a lot to baptism. Because in John, what is amazing is that, as I told you, the hour has not come, the hour is here, and the cross is about to be taken on. So the cleansing power of the church that comes through by taking the feet seriously, paying attention and paying heed to the feet, and knowing that by doing that, we indeed can be cleansed as a whole. Let me just make this side comment. We don't have it in the Gospels, but I think most of us know this basically from our experience with anybody. The feet of the common folk in most part of the world not only bear the weight of human sweat and human overweight and labor, but they also are more in touch with the earth. Feet are soiled. They are muddied by dirt, which is the mark of soil and earth. So if we can say feet knowledge is knowledge of overbearing weight, we can also say that feet knowledge is knowledge from the earth. A knowledge that actually brings all that is happening, both the hurt, the pain, and also the energy that comes from the earth. And I think this also is part of reimagining Christian unity. My second point has to be too brief because all of you have things to be done and most of you will actually work with creedal declarations, but I will get you there, but without, of course, not placing this before you as a form of a challenge. Church unity is spatial alignment with rather spatial, it's basically spatial alignment with rather than creedal declaration of what Jesus has done and is doing. Now again, it's beautifully done in terms of the gospel. I will just place this for you to read, which is 6, 66 to 69. But I want to, you to consider something else based on my main point, that in fact church unity is spatial alignment, in terms of what Jesus has done and is doing. I want to place before you somewhat creatively to consider that this is the eighth I am saying in Jesus. We know the six I am sayings kept before us. I want to say that in many ways, this indeed is the seventh. So we have, for example, I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am the gate, I am the good shepherd, I am the resurrection of the life, I am the way, the truth of the life, and I am the true vine. 
I want to place before us that this, in a creative way, is an eighth I am. That is, I am what I have done. If you'll recall this passage, after he has washed their feet, has put on his robe and returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. And then Jesus goes on to talk about them as imitating their teacher and Lord, so that they too could be, we are what he has done. So in a sense, rethinking what this means to our walking with Jesus, working with Jesus, becomes really important. And to think through what it means to say, I am what I have done. Let me briefly say that if this is part of Christian unity, to think about spatial alignments based on the feet as being primarily our foundation, we have to be training for a spirituality that involves entanglement, engagement, cultivating clean hearts and messy feet. So what we need to do in church unity is somewhat different. It is not just agreeing on a statement. It is having our bodies aligned in proximity with those weighed down to the ground. That is what is involved. It means basically creating mutual spaces of each other, taking on a spatial alignment where we serve feet first and work towards the whole body. And the second is training flexible physical postures. I've always thought in John, it's really beautiful when you think about the different physical postures of Jesus, right? So we have Jesus standing upright when in fact, He's talking to Pilate. So you have him standing upright, looking at Pilate, making his claims. You have Jesus riding on a donkey at eye level with the people and the crowd. But here you also have Jesus kneeling close to the feet. So I think working in unity, a spirituality, involves training flexible physical postures, which needs to pay attention to all that happens within the feet. Now, let me end, uh, and I will just take a minute because uh, uh, Penuel has warned me in good style that I will pull you down by your feet if you talk too much about feet. So let me actually end with a confession. Now, you remember I started off by placing this particular text within what happens in John before in chapter 12, and then later in 14, 15, 16, 17. But I have to admit that, in fact, if you take the whole Gospel of John, you cannot take only my position when you're thinking about Christian unity. The Gospel of John, in its entirety, holds together elements that I have put in tension with each other. So the whole Gospel of John is a talk back to me and what I'm pleading with you. So when you look at John, church unity involves the anointed head's vision of harmonious order and the cleansing feet's vision of just wholeness. Secondly, we also know that in the Gospel of John, church unity involves finding one's oneness in creedal declarations. And of course, in John, he actually talks about Jesus as the Holy One of God particularly a time in which many disciples are leaving him out. And it's this creedal declaration that becomes a form of galvanizing around Jesus. But it holds that together along with the spatial alignment with what Jesus has done and is doing in the world. So a form of mediating both of these becomes important for the whole message of the Gospel of John. This fullness of unity alone can witness to the prayer of Jesus. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Amen.
a través de las barreras que separan las razas, a través de las barreras que separan a los ricos de los pobres, a través de las barreras que separan a los fieles de diferentes religiones, a través de las barreras que dividen a los cristianos, a través de las barreras que separan a los jóvenes de los viejos, a los hombres de las mujeres. Instead, we sing the second song, which is, uh, we celebrate the unity of the Spirit. Let us sing, uh, many, are the br many are the lights beam, La Gorna Armanga. It's uh, on the paper or material for the plenary of unity, because we will start the plenary on unity with this song. Shall we stand? We sing verses 1 and 2. I would like to uh, thank Reverend Ott Halvor for uh, accompanying us these two mornings. Thank you. Uh, good day. From my side, I do want to welcome to a hearing session. It is all about growing in common vision of the church. So I do think you've got some information in front of you yet. In order to do it appropriately, it means that in this plenary session, we're going to argue that if our church deep in a com common vision of the church of Christ, they may grow in communion in the fellows of the church to become better servants of justice and peace in the world. And the question will be how can we as church deepen our common vision 
of the Church of Christ. Now, uh, we're going to have very informative people to address us today, namely the Reverend Dr. Durban, Durban the Professor Dr. Marin Kolovov-Polo, and Dr. Odier Pedroso Matias. What we're going to do now, um, after the short introduction, I'm going to give over to the Reverend Dr. Wadisi, who's going to help us with the singing. I think this is the hymn sheet, Lagorna Armanga. We have already seen it. Okay, thank you. So the first one is coming to the full, and I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Matthias Pedros. Uh, Matthias is the director of the Faith and Order Lecture at Ecumenical Institute of Bossi. He's an independent Presbyterian Church, Brazil, uh, in Switzerland, and he's going to address us on the issue of our growth in common, community required confidence on what we mean by the concept church. Thank you, moderator. Dear friends, this plenary is a continuation of the plenary on pilgrimage of justice and peace. But this time, this plenary is dedicated to the search for a common understanding of the church. But you may ask, what is the relationship between the search for visible Christian unity on the one hand and the search for a common understanding of the church on the other hand? Well, the answer, or perhaps one of the answers, is that many of the issues that prevent us from reaching visible Christian unity and from celebrating together the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist, many of those issues depend on the way in which we understand the church, what we mean by church. So, this means that the wider and deeper our common vision of the church is, the easier it may be for us to overcome the obstacles to communion and to holy communion. That is why this document, I mean the document that you have in your hands, and I don't. <laughs> this document, yes, that one. That is why this document was written, was produced. The Church Towards the Common Vision was written by theologians from different regions different cultures and Christian traditions which hold different, if not conflicting, understandings of what is the church and what is its mission in today's world. Those theologians were asked to, once, to answer in one single text, this one that you have in your hands, 
these theologians were asked to answer in one single text the following question. What can we say together about the Church of Christ so that we may grow in our real, though imperfect, communion, so that we may struggle together for justice and peace in the world, so that, finally, we may overcome together our past and present divisions. The theologians did their job, and they did it well. Now, it's up to our churches to respond to this document and to say to the other churches, huh? Now it's up to your church to respond to the document and to say to the church sitting next to you whether they recognize in this text their own vision of the church. And if they do, how they may form, establish closer relationships with the other churches that recognize themselves in the description of the church that is provided in this document. Is your church responding to the church towards the common vision? Is your church responding to the church towards the common vision? This is not a question about fulfill, fulfilling a duty as a member church of the WCC. This is, in fact, a question about spiritual ecumenism. Why? Because, as your church and the other churches respond to this document, and as the Faith and Order Commission analyzes your responses, what, is, what in fact is happening is much more than a simple ecumenical process around a text. What is happening, in fact, is a quiet, though precious and vital dialogue between your church and the other churches. It's a, a dialogue about being humble and letting the Holy Spirit help us to discover in each other churches elements of holiness, elements of Catholicity, elements of apostolicity that may have preserved in the other churches despite our divisions and despite our significant differences. Through this quiet, though vital and necessary dialogue, prejudices may be removed. Implicit agreements may become explicit. Mutual vulnerability and many of us know what that means here today. Mutual vulnerability may be experienced together by all of us. Mutual intercession and mutual support may become a pressing need for all of us. And mutual accountability may be strengthened. This is spiritual ecumenism. And I would say a constitutive element of what is the most deep in our commitment to a pilgrimage of justice and peace. A 
as the, as the churches respond to the church towards a common vision and grow in fellowship, they are challenged by the same token to reflect together. As the Eastern Orthodox churches are doing these days in Crete, for instance, about the centrality of the church in God's mission in today's world. In times of dwindling church attendance in some parts of the world, it's urgent to remember that the fathers and mothers of the Reformation never saw themselves outside the one holy Catholic and apostolic church and taught us to relate to the church we belong to as our mother in the faith. We remember that early teachers of the church have taught us that no one can have God as father if she or he does not have God at the church as mother. In times in which many are following the voice of other shepherds who proclaim the gospel of religious individualism and material prosperity, it's urgent to listen to the voice of the true shepherd who calls us to communion and not to the heresy of egocentrism, to quote Archbishop Athanasius, and to a communion of baptized who proclaim and anticipate the kingdom in solidarity with those who live on the margins. What is happening? What will happen to your responses to the church towards a common vision which constitute a dialogue of humility. We began to analyze them last week in Krakow, Poland, thanks to the great uh, generosity and hospitality of the Roman Catholic Church. We will be dealing with your responses, all of them, next year, God willing, in Pretoria, South Africa, in a context of church and national reconciliation which helped the churches to learn that racism is not simply an issue of ethics, but much more than that. It's an issue of integrity of the gospel and therefore integrity of the church, a learning that was once summarized by the World Communion of Reformed Churches in words that we should not, never forget. Racism is a sin, and its religious justification is a heresy. Thank you. I uh, want to thanks to the Dr. Odier Pedro Sobretiers. I'm going to invite you to the phone now to address us on the whole issue about what do we mean by the notion church, the converging arms of the church towards a common vision. And, um, it's going to address to us by Professor Dr. Marina Kalofpolo, a professor at the University of Athens, members of WCC Central Executive Committee, and she's a member of the Church of Greece. Uh, to what welcome. Thank you, Madam Moderator, Your Eminences, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. For 20 years, representatives of Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Protestant, Anglican, Evangelical, Pentecostal, and other backgrounds in the World Conference on Faith and Order in Compostela, later in three plenary commissions on faith and order, in 18 meetings of the Standing Committee, and after several drafting meetings, have sought to uncover a global, multilateral, and ecumenical vision of the nature, purpose, and mission of the Church. 
After the constructive responses to two earlier stages of this course, namely the nature and purpose of the Church and the nature and mission of the Church, the Commission on Faith and Order responded with a statement on ecclesiology, the Church towards a common vision in 2012. The document contains 69 paragraphs within four main chapters. The first chapter, God's mission and the unity of the church, with three subdivisions, the church in the design of God, the mission of the church in history, the importance of unity, explores how the Christian community finds its origin in the mission of God for the saving transformation of the world. The second chapter, the Church of the Triune God, with five subdivisions, discerning God's will for the Church, the Church of the Triune God as Kinonia, the Church as sign and servant of God's design for the world, communion in unity and diversity, communion of local churches, sets out the silent features of an understanding of the Church as communion, gathering the results of reflection, both about how scripture and subsequent tradition relate the church to God and some of the consequences of this relation for the life and structure of the church. The third chapter, the church growing in communion with two subdivisions, already but not yet, growing in the essential elements of communion, faith, sacraments, ministry, focuses upon the growth of the church as the pilgrim people moving towards the kingdom of God, especially upon several difficult ecclesiological questions that have caused divisions in the past. The fourth chapter, the church in and for the world, with three subdivisions, God's plan for creation, the kingdom, the moral challenge of the gospel, the church in society, develops several ways in which the church relates to the world as a sign and agent of God's love, such as proclaiming Christ within an interreligious context, witnessing to the moral values of the gospel, and responding to human suffering and need. The two last paragraphs form a kind of conclusion. As it is stated in the introduction of the document, while the text is not expressing full consensus on all the issues considered, it nevertheless shows how far Christian communities have come in a common understanding on the notion of the church, showing the progress that has been made and indicating work that still needs to be done. All this procedure has shown as well the needed respect to the traditions that are reflected in the text while additionally showed consistency to the constitution of WCC and to the values of the fellowship of the council as have been stated and clarified to Evanston, Toronto's and Harare's WCC assemblies. In this perspective, the answer to our main question, what do we mean by church, the converging answer of the church towards a common vision, belongs to all who have received the text and is linked to the extent that they can identify their ecclesiological identity through its content. Ecclesiology is the most difficult aspect of the Christian doctrine, and this is because the church as life and way of life in Christ is life itself. It is true that we can give numerous descriptions of life. Nevertheless, we can't define life in a strict and narrow sense. The same happens with the church. Both in Holy Scripture and in patristic tradition, we can have countless of descriptions on the church. Nevertheless, not one is limited in a strict definition. 
That is why we use metaphors. Figures of speech, like bride, ark, source of life, etc. We experience the church through the witness of the true faith and life in Christ. Thus, church, faith, doctrine, and life are inseparably connected, consisting the so-called pastoral pathos, passion. The main difficulty of ecclesiology indicates also the difficulty and the hard work of faith and order to present a document like the one you have in front of you. The theological importance of this presentation lies at a crucial point, as is mentioned in the Generalist Secretary's report. One of the reasons for trust and stability is that at least some parts of our landscape remains the same. In the landscape of ecclesiology, the document, this document, gives some of these needed points as we can conclude from its content. These points can be considered as issues of guidance and at the same time as occasions for further study, reflection, and deeper understanding of the church among various Christian traditions. Meanwhile, it gives also the opportunity through the responses to give emphasis to the truth we owe each other. I quote again General Secretary book. Through our clarity and sincerity in stating our faith. In this manner, we clear the way and we can discern the ground that we stand on and the road that has to be followed in the future. A predominant figure, a citizen of earth and heaven, a contemporary saint of the Orthodox Serbian Church, Bishop of Ohrid Nikolai Velimirovic, once raised a question. If somebody smashes a golden coin and scatters the pieces in a field, would it be possible for me, by gathering them, these pieces again, to reconstruct the coin as it was in the beginning? The task would be impossible if I don't have any idea about the form of the coin. The document of faith and order on, a, on the church could be characterized also as the field from the above story. In this field, there could be found grains of gold. Could we use them for our golden coin? We are in the happy position to know about our coin because it was given to the hotel owner for our treatment according to the gospel story. Our coin is found in the beginning of the church and there lies our history. Thus, we are starting an another pilgrimage, this time after the invitation of faith and order's text on the church. Talking about pilgrimage, we need the way to walk on. Talking about truth, we have to testify the truth of our faith. Talking about the church, we offer our life that testifies our faith. Finally, the combination of these three leads us not to a mere idea or to an abstract reality, but to our Lord Jesus Christ, who emphatically denoted that I am the way, the truth, and the life, to whom the Holy Spirit rests and to whom we see the Father, the one God in Trinity. Thank you very much.
I do want to thanks for a very powerful contribution of what exactly do we mean by church, especially in the church towards a common vision. Are you ready to render us a hymn? Thank you. So uh, after we're going to sing that uh, hymn, we're going ahead a roundtable discussions then. Turn you to a partner, maybe close near, three, four people together, and there will be questions on the screen. You're going to discuss it for approximately five minutes. Immediately after the five minutes of discussing it around the tables, I'm going to give opportunity for you for intervention. Then you can line up at the, uh, maybe at the mics, and then you can speak to me. Thank you. Let us sing La Gorma Armanga, verse 3. We will sing it twice. Shall we rise? Okay, I'm going to do it again. Uh, at the screen at this point of time, there is the question. How do you relate our growing in a common understanding of the church to our witnessing to the kingdom of God in your context? You have five minutes to discuss it.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We are going now to do something different. Thank you for all the conversations around the table. We like the energy in the room about growing in a common vision of the church. So thank you for the, inner, the way you um, discuss this whole um, document and what you already learned maybe through in the session. We are going now to invite um, three responses to come to the uh, podium in order to address us about testimonies of churches already responded on this document growing in a common vision of the church. And they know who they are by now, so they can quickly line up in order to address us. My name is Sheila Kesting. I'm the Ecumenical Officer for the Church of Scotland. Um, and as part of that job, I was the Joint Secretary. I am still uh, the Joint Secretary for the Joint Commission on Doctrine, which is a joint commission between the Church of Scotland and the Roman Catholic Church in Scotland. That Joint Commission has met since the late 1960s, with only a short break in the 1990s. In recent years, under the co-convenership of Dr. Alan Faulkner, former director of the Faith and Order Commission, and Archbishop Mario Conti, former co-convener of the Joint Working Group between the World Council of Churches and the Pontifical Council for the Promoting of Christian Unity, the Joint Commission has been encouraged to give ecumenical responses to ecumenical documents. This is in addition to our denominational response. So we set out to give a joint response to the church towards a common vision. It proved a rather difficult task, and there was a time when we thought we would need to give a broad common welcoming of the document, and then follow it with two separate parallel responses, a Church of Scotland one and a Roman Catholic one. This was partly because the Roman Catholic participants had not had the opportunity to study the document as part of a response from the Bishop's Conference to the Pontifical Council. However, we persevered and in the end succeeded in agreeing a joint text. In studying the text, we were sent back to look into our own traditions. For the Roman Catholics, texts from Vatican II were rediscovered with joy. For the Reformed, we were reminded of the thinking of Calvin and the Reformers. And all of us were reminded by the encyclopedic memory of our co-conveners of previous ecumenical texts from the Faith and Order Commission and others. Our response goes through each of the sections of the document, highlighting what we found particularly helpful. And when considering the text as a basis for growth in unity, we regretted that the churches had not been asked to go further than a simple comparative study of our current positions. For there to be growth in unity, we said, there needs to be movement beyond our current positions to a deeper understanding and appreciation of the other. In noting that there were areas identified for ongoing work, in the Faith and Order agenda, we noted that the document itself 
presented us with a challenge of its own, namely that we are called to face the challenges together as sisters and brothers in Christ. And in relation to that, it isn't enough for us simply to study the texts. We said that we needed to give encouragement to seek ever more ways of doing more together and for our leaders, our church leaders, to be seen to demonstrate in public the degree of cooperation that is possible, given the degree of convergence there is in our understanding of the church. In our conclusion, we touched on areas that required further work. And then we said... The Joint Commission wishes to reiterate its profound appreciation to the Faith and Order Commission for the production of this text. It has both challenged and encouraged our Commission in its work, helpfully flagging up areas in which we can do further thinking. We said we had heard the challenge that came from the ecumenical conversation on this document in Busan, which encourage churches to go beyond reflecting on how far it reflects their thinking, their own thinking, to the question asked in baptism, Eucharist, and ministry, namely, to what extent the faith of the church through the ages is reflected in this text. This challenge we would endorse as we look forward to further discussion and reflection. Overall, we said, this document increases our ecumenical sensitivity and encourages us to enter more deeply into the faith perceptions and even the cultural influences of those with whom we dialogue towards unity. Good morning, everybody. My name is Andrzej Chormański. I'm Polish. I'm a priest, Catholic, and I'm representing here the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity. I was asked to deliver a short information about what the Catholic Church is doing to prepare an official answer to this very important and very encouraging document, The Church Towards the Common Vision. I am pleased to do this, but before I do this, I would like to convey the best, the, the most warm greetings from our president, Cardinal Kurt Koch, and from our secretary, Bishop Brian Farrell, both of whom are now in Crete, representing the Holy Father for the, as official observers of the Catholic Church for the Synod, Pan-Orthodox Synod. So, first of all, I need to say that uh, when we speak about the, the church towards the common vision, we are speaking about a very important document uh, on the way towards the full and visible unity of the church. From the very beginning of the ecumenical movement, it was clear for all participants that there is no possibility to achieve this goal of full and visible unity because, be, without having a a vision of what the church and what the church's unity is or, or are. So uh, if we have a goal to attend, if we have a goal towards which we are heading, we need to know towards what we are heading. So to have a common vision of the church is essential from the point of view of seeking for the visible and full unity of the church. So we are most happy and pleased that uh, finally, after so many decades of work, Commission of, on Faith and Order arrived to, to make, to present this very important document, which is called a Convergence uh, Statement on, uh, on the Church. The, com the document was published officially in 2013, 
and it was sent to all the churches with, uh, uh, with uh, these five questions uh, which are in, in introduction uh, for comments and uh, official responses. So the Catholic Church started to prepare uh, an official response in 2013, and there are many stages of this work. Uh, some of them has been already accomplished, and the other steps we're about to take. So I would like to, uh, to present what has been done and what uh, will be done in the future in order to provide this uh, official Catholic response. First of all, there was an internal consultation uh, within the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity with participation of some external experts about the methodology to follow. How should we work? What should we do in order to prepare an official response? And it was decided that uh, we should ask uh, a number of uh, qualified experts in theology from all over the world, Catholic experts, to, uh, to comment on the text. And uh, after a process of discernment, about uh, 15 theologians from all over the world representing all uh, continents, uh, many local contexts, were asked to send their comments on the text to the Pontifical Council. And the task they received was not only to ask, not only to, to answer to the questions uh, which are introduced uh, by the Commission itself in the introduction to the text, but also to read this text, this document, from the point of view of the Catholic ecclesiology as it is expressed in the documents of the Second Vatican Council and the post-conciliar uh, magisterium. And uh, we have received 12 responses very qualified uh, analysis of the document um, in, uh, from different local contexts and all of them very valuable and, uh, and uh, uh, very important in this process. At that, uh, at that point, when we received all these responses and we do not expect any more of them, uh, we had another meeting in, uh, in our council with uh, our uh, responsibles and uh, some other colleagues. And at that point, uh, it was said that it is not enough to have just responses from individual theologians. If we are speaking about uh, an official uh, response to this text, we need to have also official uh, comments from Episcopal conferences. So about a half a year ago, what we did, we sent two types, two, kind, uh, two kinds of letters to Episcopal conferences. The first letter uh, was sent to all Episcopal conferences all over the world. So about 150 letters were sent, just with the purpose to promote the dissemination of this text within uh, the Catholic Church, within different ecumenical groups, and also asking for any comments if the uh, Episcopal conferences have on this, te on this te text to, s to be sent to our council. At the same time, we identified 25 other Episcopal conferences, or among those, uh, we identified 25 conferences representing uh, different local contexts from all continents, and to those chosen uh, Episcopal conferences, we sent another, let, uh, another letter, a different one, with more precise expectations and with uh, uh, precise questions, what would we like to have in these responses, as well as with copies of the, of the text itself. So now we're waiting for the official responses from Episcopal conferences, which are coming already. We have already re received uh, a number of them, but we are waiting for, for others to, to arrive. We hope to have all the responses before the end of this year or even, even before uh, that. So now we are in this stage of uh, waiting for uh, official responses from Episcopal conferences from all over the world. 
The next step will be to establish, uh, and we're already thinking about that, to establish a an, uh, an, um, theological commission which will deal with all these responses, those uh, sent by individuals and those uh, which uh, will be sent by Episcopal conferences. And this commission will uh, work uh, on all this material and will make a first draft of the official Catholic response. Uh, this draft will have to go through the process of, uh, of uh, refinement, and uh, once it is decided within our Pontifical Council that we agree on this uh, response, the text will be sent to the Congregation for Doctrine of the Faith. This is the normal process that if we speak about uh, an official response, it must be also endorsed by the Congregation for Doctrine of Faith. So only uh, once the text is endorsed by this congregation, it will be presented to the Faith and Order Commission as the official response of the Catholic uh, Church. Uh, uh, in addition to these responses we asked for, either for, uh, from individuals or from uh, Episcopal conferences, we also have received a number of responses we have not asked for, but we are very pleased to have them received from uh, different ecumenical groups or from uh, uh, theological faculties from all over the world. So there is an additional material, as well as uh, uh, during all the time we are, uh, we are making... Uh, bibliography and collecting articles and other documents related, uh, 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 which are related to this text. So we're very much engaged in the process of uh, making uh, an official Catholic response. I am not sure how much more time it will take, but what I can promise you is that there, there will be an official Catholic response uh, to, the, to this text. We are taking it very, very seriously because we are most convinced that we cannot achieve the, full, the, the, the goal of full uh, and visible communion of the church without, uh, being, uh, in, uh, uh, without uh, having a common vision of the church, its mission, and its unity. Thank you very much. Bishop Isaac Marfil Exynos, the ecumenical officer of the Martama Surian Church. I'm very happy that we were able to respond to the document. We had made a study of the document towards a common vision in the fora of bishops, clergy, and commission on ecumenical affairs and the theological commission. Of course, the clergy conferences, which we have conducted many places, we made it a point to study this document. And I'm very happy to highlight few observations that we appreciate and affirm in the document, especially the diversity is not accidental, but it is a legitimate part of creation. We live in a world of diversity and accepting the diversity and trying to understand the differences and living together. Also, 
we appreciate the position that God has designed that salvation in Christ be incarnational and take flesh among various peoples. The document also underscores the historical reality of the church and the mystery of the church. Of course, the position affirmed in the text, the understanding of local church as Catholic, as Catholicity implies fullness. Each local church has the potential to grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ since Eucharist is celebrated in every local church and each local church is a Eucharistic community. So the Matama Church recognizes the one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, the universality of the church and becoming part of it. We also welcome the common ecclesiology developed in the document on the basis of the theological understanding of communion in the Trinitarian life of God, the persons of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit existing in perichoretic relationship, mutually indwelling and acting together. The church recognizes the contextual realities of culture, language, religion, and symbols that we experience in the formation of the faith community. It also acknowledges the ecclesiological position that has already established within the church and the interchurch relations. Especially, I am happy to share the experience of the Matama Church, where we are developing the full communion relations with other churches, especially in the Protestant tradition, like the Church of South India, Church of North India, which constitutes now the communion of churches in India. And also, we experience this relationship with the Anglican Church worldwide. And currently, the Church is engaged in dialogue with the Old Catholic Church in Europe and Syrian Orthodox Church in India. The Matama Church recognizes similarities and differences with these churches, and the church hopes possibility for growth into fullness in these churches. The church is open to enter into dialogue with other churches, and we will be happy that for the last two millennia, the church has been placed in a multi-religious, multicultural, and multilinguistic context in India, amongst major other religions like Hinduism and Islam. And we coexist in a responsible manner. Yes, Matama Church is often considered as a bridge church between the Orthodox and the Protestant. And it is considered as apostolic in origin biblical in faith, oriental in liturgy, evangelical in mission, episcopal in character, ecumenical in outlook, democratic in functioning. The gathering of the church every year of more than 150,000 believers in February the bank of the river Pamba in Kerala is an occasion for renewal of the spiritual and ecumenical journey of the church, where a pilgrimage where all churches gather together 
to move forward. We are happy that the text, the church towards a common vision, challenges to make these relationships rich and vital in the life of the church. Thank you very much. From my side, uh, two words of thanks for very powerful in, um, testimonies from the Church of Scotland, especially uh, two words of thanks to the Roman Catholic Church who have, uh, have an impressive process how to um, take account and respond to us about the Church towards a common vision. We thank you heartily from our side, and as well as the Southern Orthodox Church for their contributed testimony. I'm going to go over now to the Reverend Dr. Derbus. He's going to speak about growing in common understanding of the church, making us better pilgrims of justice and peace. Thank you. At any meeting of the Faith and Order Commission, we always begin by sharing what is happening among the churches and among the people from whom we have come. And it is this place of testimony that is always the starting place of our work. So we hear about the wounds of our humanity and we celebrate what God is doing among us, the things that truly mark our lives. We are all theologians but not so much in the libraries and footnotes kind of a way. We do our theology in the midst of life, in all its raw pain and beauty. I have heard at faith and order meetings stories to turn stony hearts into flesh and stories to get the most reluctant on their feet to stand up for others. Around our table are people who really know what it means to be imprisoned for your faith. Those who are giving what little they have to welcome many refugees. Those who are responding to violence and gangs. Those whose people in their poverty are turning to things that will destroy them. Those who are trying bravely to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in cynical and secularized cultures and those who are challenging the economic powers that seem to rule the world. The Faith and Order Commission is, in the most real sense, made up of practical theologians with urgent concerns from the churches and communities that send us. We have feet as well as heads. And it is in gatherings like these that the church towards a common vision was drafted, discussed, redrafted, reshaped, until after more than 20 years we agreed we have a text. The text came from hands grubby from the dust of daily life, from minds preoccupied with suffering, from hearts crying for those in deepest need. It came from those already on a pilgrimage of justice and peace. Now, I know there are those who would say, why bother to think about ecclesiology or any ology when there is so much to be done? What does the unity of the church really have to do with overcoming poverty or making the world a better, more just and peaceful place? Now, our text was called at first the nature and purpose of the church or later the nature and mission of the church. But we have come to, to realize that this is a profoundly false distinction. It cannot be that some of us think about the church while others do what the church is supposed to do. And it's not that there is something called a church in all its abstraction, which then has a mission, which it does. Our text says something different. There is God who has a mission, has a mission for the world to heal its brokenness and pain. And God in Christ has called forth the church to share in this God's mission. To be part of the mission of God, we need to be healed ourselves, our own brokenness mended, our own divisions overcome, so that we can be what we are meant to be, a sign and a servant of God's mission for the world. 
That's what this document says. And this is why ecclesiology matters. The church needs to be renewed and to receive God's gift of communion so that we can be a witness to this gift in the world. What do we think the church is for but to serve God's great design for the world? Somehow to mirror that loving relatedness in mutual exchange of the blessed and holy trinity and to participate in God's work of healing this world. The church receives the gifts of God and offers those gifts to a wounded and divided humanity and creation. And if we're going to offer such a gift, we have first to receive it ourselves. Some might say the world cannot wait for the slowness of theologians. But we are not waiting. We are thinking on the way. We are seeing the world as it is, reflecting and acting, putting down our words like prayers for the renewal of the church for us all, while at the same time we are engaged in signing and serving the kingdom of God. People often say to me, it's time we just found that unity that Christ prayed for. At Faith and Order, we couldn't agree more. But we know that we won't find it by ignoring the dividing issues, by failing to name them clearly, and being unwilling to debate them and struggle with them until we find a way through. A pilgrimage works best when we walk beside each other and are honest with each other. Even when we say difficult things, we keep walking, listening deeply to our companions on the road and finally reaching out to hold hands in communion. Our General Secretary talked on our first day about hope. And when we think about the church together, we discover a source of hope. We look at the problems of the world, we might despair at our human failures to change them. But the church is not only a human reality, it is God's reality, and it is holy. In its embrace, we discover what God has already done and is doing out of love for this beautiful world. Our hope in the church rests on our ultimate hope in God. There are people of goodwill all over the world seeking to bring justice and peace and the healing of creation. We can walk with them, but we have a particular gift to bring as the church of Jesus Christ. We sometimes forget what deep traditions and treasures we hold in our hands as part of this one holy, Catholic, apostolic church. We have roots, traditions, wisdom. We have the gospel. We have each other to remind us about the bits we sometimes forget. We have the power of God to renew our life and to draw us into unity so the world might see and believe that a new life is possible. We share the same landscape as others in the world. But we have a different horizon. And this horizon we find as we belong to the church, the holy people of God, citizens of heaven. This is why ecclesiology really matters. So please study, respond to, reflect on, think about, share the church towards a common vision as part of our pilgrimage of justice and peace. Thank you. From my side, I do a word of thanks to the contributors of this very important session. And I'm referring you to um, Plin 
the document which is in front of you, plan 02.01, and you can see the end is questions. And they sent it quite clearly in front of you. Questions to the churches, responses expected until December the 31st, 2016. Dear brothers and sisters, we learn to powerful testimonies of the Church of Scotland, the Syrian Orthodox Church, who are member churches. We also listen to the Roman Catholic Church in the process they are going to take about the issue about our document which we named the Church Towards a Common Vision. We are pleading to you now that you attend to the, your church's response to the document. Because we need, like we learned today, that our response is not only about responding to a document, it is also an issue of spiritual ecumenism. Your engagement with the ecclesiology of the church will help us to journey on this pilgrimage to justice and peace. We learn today about God's mission and the unity of the church, the church of the triune God, the church growing in communion, the church in and for the world. So from my side, I only want to say the following, like the very same vein that we've done with the BEM document, the churches responded, the member churches responded. We need you now to respond to the document the church towards a common vision. So I plead to you, as members of the Central Committee, that you must surely try to urge your churches, the member churches in your own context, to respond so that we can put the Faith in Order and Commission in the position next year in Pretoria when they are going to have the consultation even to go forward with the issue about the church towards a common vision. I'm going to say now the following, because we also have very important guests. So can I give now over to the guests? After I thank you. The guest is the... Okay. So from my side, I'm going to, uh, we're going to leave the podium now, so we are going to say thank you, and I'm going to give over to the General Secretary. Thank you. Thank all of you for this very rich presentation and also very rich stimulation to our reflection on unity and why we are working and how we are working together for unity. I am asked to uh, give you several announcements at this point um, as this is our last plenary today. You will see in the program that we, after the coffee break we will have the regional meetings and after lunch, we will have meetings in committees. So uh, please uh, bear with me that I have to share with you for some minutes now important information for all of us. I start by announcing that the United and the Uniting Churches will have lunch together from 1 o'clock to 2.30 today in Molenberg, and sandwiches and refreshments will, ab will be available in the room. And the United and Uniting Churches participants are invited to join the confessional meeting of their choice from 7.30 to 8.30 this evening. The announcement I also will give to you is that there is a launch of an ecumenical missiology book that is prepared and presented in this Central Committee for the first time. Uh, there is a book launch, therefore, of this text, Ecumenical Missiology, Changing Landscapes and New Conceptions of Missions. And you will see that many of you present here have contributed, but also others. The launch will take place in the room called 4 and 5, Grokalm and La de Gaulle. Lunch will be provided 
free copies will be distributed to attendees. So that at least there is both a free lunch and a free copy. <laughs> it will be moderated by a colleague, Reverend Dr. Josep Kuhn. And then um, there will be a lunch meeting of the British and Irish participants in the room called Ten Munkholmen. There as well, lunch will be provided, and I think you understand why there is a need for them, and our sisters and brothers, to come together and have a reflection today. We will... Uh, this, is, this is both um, shocking news to all of us, I think, and it is an issue that we have to reflect on, both those of you who are members here from the British and Irish churches, but also all of us. And actually, we have asked the Public Issues Committee to reflect on how we can express something today as a reaction calling for the wisest and most, what should I say, the most wise statementship in this situation, both nationally and internationally, to avoid that this become more a risk for unity and peace than it has to be. So the Public Issues Committee Moderator, Bishop Samuel, are you ready to present the first draft of a short statement? And I will uh, ask the moderator, Dr. Agnes Aboom, that actually she moderates this part of the announcements because it has to be a decision-making session. Uh, and it's not only an, an, um, a piece of announcement. Good morning. Yes, we are talking about unity on a day that Brexit has already taken place. And may I, t as the General Secretary has rightly said, we now want to turn into a decision-making mode. First, I would like to invite the moderator of the public issues to present a draft of a possible statement, and then we'll take a decision on whether we can produce and issue a statement in the course of the day. Welcome, Bishop Samuel. Thank you, moderator. All of you, or most of you, if not all of you, are aware of uh, two very urgent and important things that are, have sur surpassed, have come on the forefront, have surfaced, and uh, is drawing our attention, our immediate attention. The first one, of course, being what the General Secretary and the moderator uh, just said in relation to uh, the results of uh, the referendum which took place in Britain uh, yesterday as to whether uh, Britain remains a part of the European Union or not. And the results are out with a 51.9 lead in leaving European Union, which has created shocks and tremor both within Britain and, of course, in Europe and all over the world. Um, so we need to move forward. Uh, our, uh, our director for... Um, CCIA has already prepared uh, a draft which is in its first stage. It has been well thought of. Uh, we need your wisdom and your decision on it so that it can move forward with the necessary changes if you suggest some uh, to be circulated and to be out today. We are aware that uh, our sisters and brothers from Britain are also working on this and uh, a statement hopefully in the, today or by tomorrow will be coming from the Archbishop of Canterbury and also probably, uh, and we are aware of a statement which has come from the Council of European Churches already on this subject. So uh, the WCC wants to be a part and you want to be and we all want to be a part of this 
struggle for union uh, with our churches in Britain. So the first draft will be read uh, to you now, and uh, uh, I will request Peter uh, if he has the draft. Either he, oh, it's all here. So do you want to read it, Peter? Yes. Okay. It's already in front of you. Uh, the second thing as I leave the podium to share with you is a second good news uh, which, uh, for which we will bring our document tomorrow. And this was something which came from a member chap, church to the Public Issues Committee uh, in the list of writings which came to us. And that was in relation to the peace treaty being signed in Colombia, which has been done yesterday. And we rejoice at that. We thank God for that. Uh, after a long period of violence and conflict, uh, there is a peace treaty which was signed, and a document or a statement will be coming from the Public Issues Committee tomorrow before you for hearing and for action. So let us now go through this statement and let Peter uh, explain it more to all of us so that we can make a decision on it. Peter. Thank you very much, uh, um, Mr. Moderator. Um, first of all, let me acknowledge that this text has not yet had the privilege of being reviewed by the, uh, all the members of the Public Issues Committee. It's been prepared, understandably, on very short notice. Um, but the text is before you in plenary now for your consideration. I will read it um, as it stands. Uh, the outcome of the referendum in the United Kingdom on EU membership heralds a seismic shift in the political and social landscape of the region. The decision of a majority of UK voters commits the country <clears throat> to ending its 43-year-long membership of the regional bloc and the hitherto prevailing trajectory towards political and economic unity in the European region. While the medium to longer-term implications of this decision and its implementation remain unclear, its most immediate and obvious consequence is uncertainty and anxiety regarding the future, especially taking into account the very significant minority of UK voters who envisaged a future for their country within the EU. Uncertainty and disunity are themselves serious challenges in a time requiring collective responses and solutions to a range of pressing regional and global issues. This is a situation that calls for wise leadership nationally regionally and internationally to avoid the most severe effects of division and for sober but swift reflection on the implications and implementation of this decision so as to reduce the uncertainty and disruption that inevitably flow from the referendum outcome. As a global fellowship of churches to which Christian unity is a fundamental value and calling we urge the government and people of the United Kingdom to remain committed to seeking unity of purpose and action in addressing the serious challenges facing the region and the world from which the United Kingdom cannot isolate itself. The WCC is committed to accompanying the churches of the United Kingdom as they seek to promote that unity of purpose and action following this referendum. That's the draft text as it stands. It has been consulted on uh, among staff and the leadership of the Public Issues Committee and with input from the General Secretary. Uh, it is before you for your consideration right now and for appropriate action, bearing in mind the limitations of time that we currently have available in this session. I uh, return the floor to um, the moderator. Thank you for the swift reaction. May I see if we have any comments? Can we flash back the text, please? Because I don't think we have. Yes, microphone number one. This is microphone number three. Number three, sorry. I thought you were looking at me. Yes, there was a blue card here, that's why. Fernando Enz, Mennonite Church, Germany. Thank you very much for uh, the quick uh, response and this proposal uh, as it is before us. Uh, one concern that I would like to raise is that the, at the end of the text you are addressing um, the, the British people 
uh, British government, I think there should also be an address to the rest of Europe uh, with a note like, you know, un asking the European Union and all of us who live in Europe uh, that we have to rethink and reconsider what is the basic ground on which we stand and on which we built this European Union. And um, my impression and my, my, my fear is that uh, we have lost track within the European Union, and, the, and this is one of the results that we see now, to create this union around the values uh, of this European Union. Uh, we have put so much emphasis on the economy, uh, and um, so in that text I would like to see, you know, not only talking to the Brits, but also talking to the rest of Europe to say, well, it's unless you'd started to reconsider again what is the basis of your union, we uh, see high risks here. Thank you. I see support from the floor to that amendment that we do include the larger Europe. <coughs> Can I see your support? Yes, thank you. And then I turn to microphone two. Um, Robert Innes, Bishop of the Church of England Diocese in Europe. Um, it's a very sad day for the UK. Um, this is an extremely serious uh, development, uh, which has major implications not just for the UK but for Europe as a whole. Um, I would draw the Assembly's attention to the excellent statement issued by Keck on this subject, which exhorts us to uh, exhorts European leaders to find a way of uh, aspiring towards a unity which will capture the, the hearts and imaginations of our peoples. There is a, a major crisis across Europe with an elite, of which I guess I am a member, uh, which is out of touch with ordinary people. And this vote reflects that, and it's not unique to the UK. It, it is a feature of European politics in general. There is absolutely a need for a European Union which connects with the values, uh, with, with values and with hearts, and not simply with the economy. I, I'm, I'm not happy with the, the sentence which asks for swift reflection on the implications and implementation of this decision. Uh, Article 50 takes two years to work through, uh, and the, the full implications of this decision will, will take many years to work through. Uh, and it's simply unrealistic to suppose that that can be done, quotes, swiftly. So I would appreciate that being removed. Uh, and and fi finally, I would say the Assembly needs to be aware that the great majority of church leaders, Christian leaders in the UK, have made their positions on this issue very clear and have done, we've done our best to draw to our population's attention the importance of unity within the EU, but we have not succeeded. Uh, and we, we appreciate your friendship and your support, uh, at, and we pledge as, as Christian leaders uh, our commitment to, to be outward looking and to maintain bonds of friendship with uh, brother and sister churches in Europe and beyond. Thank you. Thank you. I hear a suggestion not to be as swift, but provide a period of two years by the floor. The formulation as it is now, if you can read, yes. Would that be acceptable? Yes. Can I see your cards on that proposal that the consideration is not as swift, but it is given some time? I see blue, yellow cards. I see blue Okay, I come to microphone one. Um, Everdith Landau, PCUSA, I will be speaking in English member. Um, even while we um, are focusing on making a statement on unity, I, I think it is also important to acknowledge the sovereignty and democracy of the people of the UK and what I understand has been over 30 million voters that made this decision. So I think that as we also seek unity, it is also important to uh, respect and acknowledge within our statement um, the tough decision of a whole nation um, as well. 
This is a decision-making session, and that means it is members of Central Committee. It's a decision-making session. May I remind us? It is confined to members of Central Committee, not advisors, please. So I'll thank you for the comment from, I'll turn back to microphone two. Cornelia Fulco ah, so, and Yes, microphone two and then microphone four. Okay, Cornelia Fulco Gweitzel, EKD, member substitute. Um, I build on all the arguments which have been shared with us before. Uh, and uh, want to underline that it might be important not to comment on the decision of um, the UK people because it's their sovereign right to do so and not to address them mainly and not to seem to kind of comment what they were doing but rather um, ask for uh, any yeah, to, for all efforts of the churches within Europe, I, w I would start with the churches as well as then with uh, the governments to um, to increasingly show the value of uh, unity and the value of um, unite the value of not turning to racism, nationalism, fascism, what have you again, because this will in encourage many movements within Europe to separate or to ask for. Uh, more nationalism. It will encourage the wrong mood from our point of view, and I would rather like to see that addressed than see the UK people addressed. So you will be affirming what Professor Fernando had initially talked about in terms of values. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Microphone. Microphone four, please. Thank you, moderator. I am in a very strange place today. I have an Irish passport but I live and minister in Northern Ireland, which is part of the United Kingdom. So I'm a bit of a schizophrenic today. I'm not quite sure I am, so forgive me for that. But I want to say three things. Firstly, I think it's fair to say that democracy is spoken, and we have to honor that. So we need to find a way of not, in a sense, attacking the British people because they have spoken. I did vote, and my postal vote was to remain within the UK, but I have to honor the decision of the British people, whether I like it or not. The second thing I want to say is that I think it's very important we don't just focus on European Union. This is now a serious crisis within the United Kingdom. And I speak as someone who comes from Northern Ireland. The future of the borders at stake, the future of Scotland's at stake. Wales just about voted to leave as well. So the whole United Kingdom is at stake. I think we need to urge the government of the UK to also look how they find a way of healing the wounds within the United Kingdom itself. And my third point, which probably worries me most of all, one of the tragedies of this referendum was that migrants and refugees were used as pawns by both sides of the debate. We need to speak for those people that they need protected and looked after and nurtured because they are victims in this and could actually become even more victims. So please find a way of speaking for the voiceless people. Thank you. Thank you. So if the, I see cards supporting the need to add a sentence on the protection of those that were used as pawns. Microphone two, and then I'll turn to microphone one. Uh, moderator, I just have one point to uh, uh, suggest two. that in this particular statement... Microphone uh, two, please. I'm four, sorry. I'll, <laughs> microphone two, and then one, and four. Thank you, moderator. Angelique Walker-Smith, National Baptist Convention, USA Incorporated. I rise as a citizen of the United States of America, and I really want to encourage us, however we can be as broad as possible, it would be very helpful around these issues of unity, as we're seeing proliferation also in the United States, around division and all the rest. So I come from out of that context to make my remarks. I am really hoping that in the statement we will actually say where is this statement coming from? We are talking about unity this morning. Uh, it seems to me we ought to talk out of our own experience here of working through issues of unity, something to refer to actually we're taking this action during a conversation about unity and its value. Um, and second of all, to also say that we're offering prayers. Uh, really speaking out of our faith around this context that is very troubling, again, not only in Europe, but throughout our world. So to speak out of our faith and to speak out of this context in which we take this action would be very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. As we go to the mics, I want to say those who are at the microphones now, 
will be the last people so that if you have any additions, please submit them to the moderator or the director and we'll bring back the text, but your comments will be taken into account. Microphone one and then microphone four. Yes, for uh, purposes of time, I'd like to limit my comment just uh, simply going off of what uh, Dr. Cornelia had mentioned, that I believe that the tone, from my understanding of her comments, and she'll have to forgive me if I get this cor uh, incorrect, that the tone of the document needs to be directed towards unity of mm -hmm. the current European members. Mm -hmm. I find it ironic that we're discussing this in Norway, which isn't part of the European Union, we're discussing it about a country that decided that we don't feel like we're gaining anything or there's nothing to gain from being a member of the European Union. Having myself personally experienced the European Union Parliament, sometimes it does feel like a lot of technocrats and bureaucrats discussing issues that seem to have nothing to do with the grandmother tilling soil in Bulgaria or a truck worker working in Cardiff. And I think it's it's a disconnect that Europeans, as a European citizen, as a citizen of the Hellenic Republic, that we have a disconnect with our fellow European brothers. There isn't like the WCC that gives the opportunity for all of the churches to come together and have an equal playing ground. Sometimes it feels that certain member churches take precedence over the whole committee meeting. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Thank you. Uh, microphone four, and then microphone three, and finally, microphone two. Yeah, moderator, in the context of a troubled Europe and in many ways a troubled world, I think the ecumenical task is to be articulated also in terms of the churches needing each other. And that needs to, be cl to clearly come out in such a paper, uh, which will, and it sh should resonate with the hearts and minds. I think the tone of that whole thing uh, would antagonize many people in the Church of England, at least, who have a problem with relating to people in the European Commission, not so much in the European Parliament, but in the Commission. So there is a way of writing this, but I think the public issues, there are many from the uh, United Kingdom in that public issue committee who will be able to deal with that. But I think we need to have a theological uh, point here to say churches need each other in these troubled times. Thank you. Microphone three. Thank you, moderator. May I see the um, end of the statement where we are pledging our... Um, accompaniment as, as a church towards the end. Yes. Um, I was wondering, moderator, whether we wouldn't be a little bit specific uh, by naming and inviting our constituent, constituencies to engage in a prayer um, for that part of the world, but for the whole world, where we invite our God to be involved um, in what is happening in the world, um, accompanying them, but at the same time inviting each other uh, to engage into prayer across the world and inviting God to be at the center of this. Thank you. Last one on microphone two, please. Thank you, moderator. I'm afraid I will end uh, this session from the point that uh, the first speaker uh, started it. As a Greek and as an Orthodox, I would like to call to, the, to your mind that uh, this morning we have been speaking about the unity in Christ, but the European Union is not a unity based on values, only on economic interests. Therefore, this unity is very much fragile, and as a candidate to Brexit last year, I do understand what are the problems in the European Union itself. It's not a matter to be in solidarity with the British people that they are going to solve their own problems as a power, a powerful uh, nation, but it's a matter how to to maintain the unity uh, in the Europe itself, which is very much uh, uh, fragile because it neglected the human values and it neglected the human dignity. I'm coming from a point that where a, a lot of hotspots are, thousands and millions of uh, uh, refugees pass by, and this is not Europe. This is not the face of Europe. Therefore, our uh, call will be to the Europe itself and not to the British people who decided themselves. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. 
I'm aware that we have a lot. Please do share with the leadership and the committee. We'll come back with a, a refined statement in the morning. Tomorrow morning. We have been discussing towards a common vision of unity. And I want to thank those who have contributed. At the same time, it is a reminder of the brokenness, of the fragile nature of the globe we live in, and hence the need for us to move forward with commitment towards working for the unity of humankind as well. Thank you. I'll invite the General Secretary to make his comment. So before we do that, can we then adopt this, because this was an additional statement, as a statement of the Central Committee. Can I see members of Central Committee that we will be issuing this as a statement? Can I see your cards? Can I see your cards? Yes. Yes, with an amended version that comes as a statement. We have four statements. This is going to be one of the other statements. I hope I'm clear. Yeah? We, ha we will have more than four statements. You already have texts of four statements, but we'll have more than four statements. Can I see the show of your, hand, your cards, please? Thank you. Thank you. And this um, means that we go back to the modus of receiving information. The decision-making session is over. And therefore, I inform you that the regional meetings, which is scheduled to start at 11.30, has to be postponed a little bit so that you, at least you can grab your coffee on your way. But I think we should, uh, we should uh, allow ourselves 15 minutes break at all, at least. But please note where the regional meetings will be held. So, uh, Take your pen and write the name of the meeting room where your region will meet. I don't read them. You can read it from the screen. And you have 15 seconds to write down the name of the room. Okay. We go to the next announcement. It's okay. Yeah. which is about the committees this afternoon and where they meet. And there I actually need to make you aware of that not all will meet in the hotel. One has to meet in the neighbor hotel, in Royal Garden Hotel, to have enough big rooms. It's an easy and quick walk just across the bridge, not the flower bridge, but the big bridge, and you have the Royal Garden Hotel on your left-hand side, which is to be noticed for the Public Issues Committee. Have you written down the name of your meeting room for your committee? <coughs> then we go to another piece of information. We will have prayers at the afternoon in Bakke Church, which is 600 meters away from the hotel. Then we walk over the flower bridge, and the architecture of the church is traditional from the 17th century, um, red wooden church. It should be easy to see it as you cross the bridge. Orders of worship will be provided at the church entrance. And then... In the evening, we have confessional meetings. And then again, I ask you to take note of where your confessional group will meet. And there again, we have to remind those who are belonging to the Orthodox group that they will make use of the bigger meeting room in the Royal Garden Hotel across the bridge. Not the flower bridge, but the big bridge, and then on the left-hand side, Royal Garden Hotel.
we see that as three groups are asked to find your own space, believing that there are spaces in the hall, uh, I mean, in the entrance and in the bar, or other places where you can find a proper place to sit down. Dinner will be provided for the confessional meeting of the Orthodox, as far as I, I read this correctly. Huh? And then, please take your belongings with you from this room as you move to the regional meetings and to the other meetings this day. And don't forget your consensus cards. Without them, you cannot make consensus. <laughs> and then I have one additional information, which is not on the screen. And that is that actually we have in our midst two guests from Ukraine. And I want to present them to you so that you can also interact with them during this day. Please come forward. This is uh, His Excellency Luca, Archbishop of, Archbishop of Saparigia and Melitu in Ukraine, and Archpriest Mikolai Danlevici, the Deputy Chair of the External Interchurch Department of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. <laughs> we welcome you in our midst, as we have also been relating to one another in the last years. It is known through our reports, but this is also an opportunity for the whole cell committee also to have individual conversations with you. We will also invite you to the policy reference committee so that there can be a more in-depth conversation about the situation in Ukraine. So please uh, feel welcome among us and be here in peace with us. Thank you. Thank welcome. You. And that means that we have come half an hour behind the schedule. If we can reduce our coffee break to about 15 minutes, I think the damage is to be dealt with. Well, actually, there is one more. Ah, there's a, the, 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 the rescheduled meeting of the African and an African Diaspora Central Committee participants will take place tomorrow, Saturday, at 20 hours in number nine, Gamble Bibro. That's it. Thank you.